I welcome you again for this NPTEL online course on earthquake geotechnical engineering and this is lecture number 42 which is on slope stability analysis and retaining walls. So, the, we are under module 5 of this course and we already cover introduction to earthquake induced landslides. First chapter is over. The second chapter static slope stability analysis is a partly covered. So, we will discuss in this lecture uh, the second chapter that will be over and then we are going to talk the third chapter also seismic slope stability analysis. <coughs> Coming to the static slope stability analysis, there are two methods which we have discussed. One is limit equilibrium analysis and another is stress deformation analysis. So, we already started in the last lecture discussion on limit equilibrium analysis we will continue from there and continue from and this is as I acknowledged earlier that most of the material is from Kramer's book. Uh, the static slope stability analysis uh, in case of this limit equilibrium analysis in concept any slope theoretically if the factor of safety is above 1 in that case the slope should be stable. However, in practice the level of stability is seldom considered acceptable unless the factor of safety is significantly greater than 1 and criteria for acceptable factor of safety recognize that uncertainty in the accuracy which with, with which the slope stability analysis represent the actual mechanism of failure. So, though factor of safety more may be more than one, but the we need to understand this factor of safety has been determined with some uncertainties. What, do, what are those uncertainties? The first of the uncertainty uh, the itself the methodology that how accurate the, the slope stability analysis is the uh, actually representing the actual failure mechanism which is occurring in the field. Normally, these methods may be conservative side, but still it is not guaranteed that they represent the actual failure mechanism which is occurring. The second uncertainty could be in accuracy with the input parameters for example, shear strength, ground water condition, slope geometry, it has been determined because when we carried out the slope stability analysis, then we assume some geometrical property or the material properties that should represent the actual condition, but they are, they are uncertain. The third could be the likelihood and duration of exposure uh, to various types of external loading and the fourth the potential consequence of slope, slope failure because if slope get failed then uh, there is maybe a lot of you know catastrophic damage. So, as a result normally the factor of safety is kept quite high compared to only one in case of slope stability. Typically, it is suggested that minimum factor of safety used for slope uh, design for a static case for the long term is at least about 1.5 for normal long term loading condition and about 1.3 for temporary slopes or end of construction conditions in permanent slopes. So, in, in any case the factor of safety should not be suggested if factor of safety is suggested is at least 1.3 in any case. Even if you keep factor of safety equal to 2, no problem. If it is quite high the compared to 1.5, it is all right. Coming to this, uh, continue with the limit equilibrium anal uh, analysis. When the minimum factor of safety of slope reach to a value 1, then the available shear strength of the soil is fully mobilized on some potential failure surface and the slope is at the point of incipient failure. So, if the what happens like you determine the factor of safety and you said that factor of safety is greater than 1. But then what happens some loading have increased and the factor of safety start decreasing. Then factor of safety reaches to the value 1, then the failure will likely to take place along some the potential failure surface. Any additional loading will cause the slope to fail that is to deform until it reaches. Now, when your slope is start getting fail, then again it will come in the equilibrium. and until it reaches a configuration in which the shear stresses required for equilibrium are less than the equal to the available shear strength of the soil. So, this is the kind of phenomenon in the landslide also. When the landslide started occurring, then again that, that will stop when again there is equilibrium between the shear stresses and strength. So, similar is the case for the slope stability also. That means, uh, again there is uh, your shear stress become less than the shear strength, then it will be okay. Continue with this, the limit equilibrium assumptions of risk perfectly plastic behavior suggest 
that the required deformation will occur in a ductile manner. Many soils, however, exhibit brittle strain softening, stress strain behavior. So, the behavior of the many soils are brittle, it could be strain softening, and in such cases, the peak shear strength may not be mobilized simultaneously at all points on the feller surface. So, you have a feller surface that does not mean that peak's strength will be mobilized at each and every point on the feller surface simultaneously. For example, this in this slide it is explained uh, like uh, in a good way how it has been explained here. You have uh, let us say this uh, what is in this uh, figure A tau versus gamma that means shear stress versus shear strength and the peak value peak strength is mobilized at point A and if we see in the slope this is the potential feller surface this uh, this which is maybe circular point a peak strength have reached now other points b and c they will have the less strength compared to the peak value so the what will happen when the feller will start from point a now when the point a has get failed then what will happen it continue in the after some time then this feller will start reaching to point B and C. So, what will happen? There will be redistribution of stresses. Now, the stress at point A becomes a residual strength. So, it was the peak value in the first part A, but now A, a point at point A, you left with a shearing resistance that drops from peak to residual strength. But now, the point B got your peak strength, and so that means earlier feller point was A, now it moved to B and then C as a result slowly slowly your entire this surface, this potential feller surface will get failed. So, this is the progressive feller in slope comprised of strength softening material. So, whatever is written is uh, what is already explained here. <coughs> so, the and the peak strength in any case may not be mobilized simultaneously which is the case first it is mobilized at point A then move to point B and then later on point, point C. In a case of uh, continuing with the limit equilibrium analysis this should be first of all must be formulated with great care. Since the available shearing resistance of the soil depends on pore pressure drainage conditions those conditions must be considered carefully in the selection of the shear strength and pore pressure conditions for the analysis. In fact, you may be aware that there are two types of parameters, one is called total stress, another is effective stress or we say that uh, you have the shear strength parameter total or the effective shear strength parameters. So, when there is increase in pore water pressure, then the your uh, let us say if you have the C and phi first, the without like in case of when without pore water pressure, then the pore water pressure is generated then it will be become C dash and phi dash. And normally the effective parameters are the values are less than the total. So, that means effective parameters. So, th this will reduce the strength basically. So, when the pore water pressure is present due to the excess pore water pressure present, then there will be decrease in the shear strength parameters. And those conditions must to be considered when we deal with the slope stability. Now, guidelines for the selection of the input parameter for limiting are available in literature and what those guidelines some of the guidelines says like uh, uh, we will discuss uh, like particularly when we talk about uh, uh, seismic slope stability. Now, the this was about the limit equilibrium analysis for static slope stability analysis. In another case static slope stability analysis also can be carried out stress deformation and method. Why this is required? Because stress deformation analysis allow the consideration of the stress system behavior of soil and rock and most commonly performed using the finite element method. When applied to slopes stress can predict the magnitude and pattern of stresses. So, first of all this will in, in case of uh, limit equilibrium analysis you get only the factor of safety, but here using stress deformation analysis you can get the magnitude and as well as the pattern of the movement of the stresses at different locations and it can also help you to find out excess pore pressures in slopes during and after construction deposition. So, the good point that uh, like uh, if you move from limit equilibrium analysis then you can get the in more information related to stress 
excess pore pressure and most importantly deformations or which is completely missing in the, uh, the limit equilibrium analysis. Further nonlinear stress stress behavior can also be considered, complex boundary condition, irregular geometries and a variety of const construction operations can all be considered in modern finite element analysis. So the first of all the stress deformation analysis is done using FEM finite element method. Naturally it is not going to be as easy like as you have done for the limit equilibrium. Limit equilibrium analysis can be carried out using the hand calculator but or maybe at the most spreadsheets. But for the, uh, for the stress deformation analysis you require finite element method. So as a result some software need to be used. The accuracy of de stress deformation can be strongly influenced by the accuracy with the stress session model parameters are obtained. Many different stress session models have been used for stress deformation analysis of slope and each one has different constitutive models have their advantage as well as limitations. The accuracy of the simple models is usually limited to certain range of strength or strength paths. So this was about stress deformation analysis which is related to static slope instability analysis. So with this we covered both the topics of static slope instability analysis. We finished limit equilibrium analysis as well as stress deformation analysis. Now we are going to move the third chapter of this module which is on seismic slope instability analysis we are going to introduce first after introduction we are going to talk about analysis of inertial instability and then we are also going to talk about pseudo static analysis. In fact pseudo static analysis is a counterpart you can say in kind of an extension of limit equilibrium analysis. In case of pseudo static analysis is used for the dynamic loading or for or earthquake loading while limit equilibrium analysis is used for the static case. So let us discuss first with the introduction seismic slope instability analysis. In this case uh, when we talk analysis of the seismic slope is further complicated by the need to consider the effects of dynamic stresses which is induced by earthquake shaking. The effects of those stresses on the strength and stress station behavior of slope deformed materials. So uh, the, the, the effects of dynamic stresses which are induced by the earthquake shaking. So that will be one part. The second is what is the effect of these stresses on what is the constitutive relationship or we say stress system behavior of slope, slope materials. So coming to this part based on these effects seismic slope instability may be grouped into two categories. One is called the inertial instabilities, another is called weakening instabilities. The shear strength of the soil remain relatively constant but slope deformations are produced by temporary accidents of the strength by dynamic earthquake stresses. So in this case there are two categories. One category is in case of inertial instability, the shear stresses which is generated due to the external loading may pass the shear strength. So it may be more than the shear strength and but slope deformations which are produced by temporary accidents uh, and this is as a kind of a temporary accidents. But in case of weakening instability, it could be earthquakes may serve like to weaken the soil sufficiently that it cannot remain stable under earthquake induced stresses. So when earthquake induced stresses are there, for example, liquefaction. So flow liquefaction and cyclic mobility are common causes of weakening instability. In that case, the equilibrium will not be maintained and it will be failure. So, so we will discuss the first part inertial instability in very much detail and we will introduce the weakening instabilities. Coming to the uh, analysis of inertial instabilities, earthquake motions can induce significant horizontal and vertical dynamic stresses in slopes. So when due to the earthquake there will be uh, like uh, uh, stresses will be generated which could be horizontal and vertical dynamics in the slope, horizontal as well as vertical. These stresses which is generated due to earthquake produce dynamic normal and shear stresses along potential failure surface within a slope. Uh, when you have a slope then there will be a potential failure surface which is now many times called slip circle. So and along this potential failure surface dynamic normal and shear stresses will be produced. When superimposed upon the previously existing static shear stresses the dynamic shear stresses may exceed the available shear strength of the soil and produce what we call the inertial instability of the slope. So uh, like you have the additional stresses which is generated due to earthquake or due to this loading. 
and when these additional stresses are generated, these additional stresses is superimposed on already existing stresses which was due to the static loading. So, the already the, because the due to the static loading there will be stresses and when this slope is subjected to earthquake motion or earthquake shaking, then additional stresses will be superimposed on upon that and this total stress may produce what is called inner inertial instability of the slope. Now, when we talk about uh, a number of techniques are there for the analysis of inertial instability, one of the method is called pseudo static analysis and the pseudo static analysis produces a factor of safety against seismic slope failure and it is in the similar way as we discussed limit equilibrium analysis for the static case and the similar way as the, uh, the limit equilibrium analysis produces a factor of safety. So, in the pseudo static analysis you get a factor of safety even when you consider the loading due to earthquake. And then there are other approaches which evaluate permanent slope displacement produced by earthquake shaking and which is uh, other approaches one of the approaches stress deformation analysis similar to what we discussed for the static case. Now, we will discuss the first pseudo static analysis in very much detail and other approaches will be discussed later. Coming to the pseudo static analysis, the effects of effects of an earthquake is represented by constant horizontal or vertical acceleration. So, what is considered like in the pseudo static analysis, the effect of earthquake is uh, uh, like two additional forces when the earthquake shaking is considered horizontal force as well as vertical force is considered. Usually the effects of earthquake shaking is represented by pseudo static accelerations that produce what we call the inertial forces F h and F v which act through the centroid of the failure mass. So, first of all which act through the centroid of let us see here. So, in this case you have the slope a and b in this slope W, W is the basically this W, what is this W? This W is nothing but the mass or weight of this load of this slice triangle. So, if you go A, B and let me put this point C. So, if you have A, B, C and in this case the total weight is represented by W and mind it that irrespective of the slope angle beta, whatever the value of beta, this W will always vertically downward because it is a force, it is under, in, a, in the direction of gra gravity and in fact W is nothing but if you know the mass then you know W is mass of this multiplied by g acceleration due to gravity and this load will act always in the downward direction. Then you have two forces F h and F v and these two forces are due to seismic loading or earthquake loading. F h is a force which is a uh, horizontal seismic force. This horizontal seismic force though in actual earthquake condition there will be to and fro. So, like, let us see if I consider horizontal then one side this will act this side in another reversal this will act like this side. However, because when this F h is acting towards the slope then it will provide more stability to the slope rather than decreasing the factor of safety. So, that condition uh, the loading of the earthquake loading lateral loading by which the slope is getting more stable is not considered rather a condition where slope is getting weakened is considered when f h is acting outward that condition is considered. So, always f h will consider outward direction out uh, like going away from the slope while the f v which is the force vertical force due to the earthquake loading in this case is shown upward that means opposite to the w but it could be upward or it could be downward it can be considered. So, what is in this case the magnitude of the pseudo static forces are given by this relation f h equal to a h w by g and simply k h and w and f v is also or finally, k, k v and w where a h and a v are nothing but the horizontal and vertical pseudo static accelerations and while k h and k v are dimensionless horizontal and vertical pseudo static coefficients respectively and W is the weight of the failure mass. So, W is the basically weight seismic weight. Now, the force horizontal force due to uh, like uh, due to this uh, 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 this earthquake or shaking is represented by k h into W where k h is dimensionless 
and K V is also dimensional. Or in another words, K H and K V can also be linked. K H is nothing but A H horizontal acceleration divided by G, while K V is horizontal uh, vertical acceleration that is A V divided by G. So, the K H and K V are linked with the, if you know the K H and K V, then simply A H and A V can be find out by multiplying these factors with the G. Now, if we know the value of kh and kv which are dimensionless horizontal and vertical pseudo-static coefficients then you can find the seismic weights. So, this is how it is done the value of kh and kv is assumed or it is like based on some uh, PGA value this is decided once kh and kv is defined uh, decided then rest of fh and fv is almost known to you and then we can proceed to find the factor of safety. The magnitude of the kh and kv should be naturally related to the severity of the anticipated ground motion. So, naturally if suppose nothing is given then the kh and kv should be higher in higher seismic zone compared to the lower seismic zone. So, this was about uh, this uh, uh, value of f how to calculate fh and fv and this fh and fv is used here. So, forces acting on the triangular waves of soil above planar failure surface in pseudo static slope stability analysis. Now, in this case when this force f h and f v is also acting f h is acting outward to the slope and f v is acting in the negative uh, towards opposite to the w. In that case the factor of safety of this potential failure surface is given by this relation where c and phi are the parameters shear strength parameters because th these are the effective shear strength parameters while l is the length of the the like length of the code length of the basically in this case l will be simply length from here to here. Here this for the simplicity we are assuming that this is a triangular rectangular uh, triangular, but this could be possible that you have a slope and in let us say for the example this is slope, but you consider a circular failure surface. So, in that case circle there could be the circular failure surface also. So, that also be considered and that is not an issue. Coming to this uh, like L, L is this distance from A to B along the failure surface and uh, C and phi we already defined W is the low weight of the slice and FH and FV are already defined where FH is nothing but KH into W and FV is nothing but KV into W. C and phi are the more coulomb strength parameters that describe the shear strength on the feller plane and L is the length of the feller plane. Continue with the pseudo-static analysis, it can be observed that the horizontal pseudo-static force decreases the factor of safety which is very clear from this uh, equation. You see the FH is de de decreasing the numerator because negative sign is coming while it, it is increasing numerator or uh, denominator. So, as a result the factor of safety will decrease when you consider some value of fh and while fv as far fv is concerned fv is decreasing numerator as well as denominator. So, as a result uh, the effect of fv is not so much. So, the vertical shooter force typically has less influence on the factor of safety since it reduces or increases depending on its direction. If direction is upward then it reduces, if direction is downward then it increases the both the driving force and the resisting force. So, it will increase the driving force as well as resistance either increase or decrease. As a result the effect of vertical uh, accelerations are frequently neglected in pseudo static analysis. So, when this you use this uh, this equation many times it is done that F v is assumed 0 there is no this one. So, this is cancelled out and you left with F h only. This equation can be further simplified when c equal to 0. If you have the c equal to 0 then f h and f v can be represented in terms of <coughs> w and then w will be cancelled out from the numerator as well as the, the denominator and the equation becomes more simplified. <coughs> so, the result of pseudo static analysis are critically dependent on the value of the seismic coefficient k h because k v can be neglected k v can be assumed as 0, but you uh, in any analysis you should not do other way that you are assuming k v and k h equal to 0. In any case k h should be considered 
kv may be considered or may not be considered that is optional so when the kh is considered now the issue comes what value of kh should be taken for the analysis the selection of an appropriate pseudo stability coefficient is the most important and most difficult aspect of a pseudo stability analysis the seismic coefficient control the pseudo static force on the failure mass so its value should be related to the some measure of the amplitude of the inertial force induced in the potential unstable material so when we want to link with that in that case naturally the value of this coefficient kh will depends on your zone in which zone seismic zone whether seismic activity is high or low depending on that it can be decided if the slope material is the inertial force induced on a potential failure surf slide would be equal to the product of horizontal acceleration and mass of the unstable material so whatever the you have the horizontal acceleration and the mass of the material which is unstable if you multiply by that then you will get the force however actual slopes are not reached which is the considered in limit equilibrium analysis and which is extended as in the pseudo static analysis so the actual slopes are not reached and the and that the peak acceleration exists for only a very short time the peak value will comes only momentarily it is not last for a long the pseudo static coefficients used in precise generally uh, uh, in practice generally correspond to acceleration values which is linked with the uh, a max or you can say that the values for pseudo static coefficient you should give you the acceleration corresponding acceleration which is quite below a max so basically what is said here if you have the value of ah which is nothing but kh multiplied by g so this way you can find the value of ah and g acceleration due to gravity and once this is known ah is known then the value of ah should be less than the value of a max it cannot be exceed the value of a max which is a pga so in any case it cannot be more than pga value that uh, this uh, acceleration due to uh, the uh, horizontal acceleration or vertical acceleration now coming to this one uh, like the how the values of this kh can be estimated tarjagi in 1950 originally suggested that the uh, kh can be assumed 0.1 for severe earthquake while kh can be assumed 0.2 for violent or destructive earthquake so this was by tarjagi long back very conservative approach for pseudo static coefficient should be based on the actual anticipated level of acceleration in the failure mass then it should be corresponding to the some fraction of the anticipated peak acceleration so it is said that it should be linked with the peak acceleration the value of it should be some fraction of the peak acceleration so margusan in 1981 suggested that appropriate pseudo static coefficients for dam should be correspond to 1/3 to 1/2 of the maximum acceleration so that means the value of kh could be somewhere 1 by 3 to 1 by 2 multiplied by a max for example if we are lying in seismic zone 5 so in the seismic zone 5 you have the value of kh will be 1/3 of 0.36 1/3 of 0.36 so will be 0.12 to half half will be 0.18 so the value of kh which should be taken for the analysis for zone 5 like for as a thumb rule should be lying between 0.1 to 0.18 and an average value kh can be taken as 0.15 and this 0.15 is the value for the seismic zone 5 and this is for the highest zone which is zone 5 so for the zone 5 it could be taken as 15% 0.15 representation of the complex transient dynamic effects of earthquake shaking by a single pair constant and unidirectional processor and naturally this is quite crude that we are representing by earthquake force by a single parameter kh kh multiply by w will give the horizontal force due to earthquake tarjagi stated that the slopes could be unstable even if the computed pseudo static factor of safety is greater than 1 this we already discussed experience has already shown that pseudo static analysis can be unreliable for soils that should be produce large excess pore pressure or show more than about 15% degradation of strength due to earthquake loading so there may be two reason 
One is the soils which produce large earthquake pressure, uh, pore pressure. The second reason could be that uh, there could be degradation of strength which could be as high as about third, uh, third, uh, 15 percent degradation of strength is taking place, then we need to call off this. Now, it has been observed in the past, then some dams has been designed using pseudo static approach and those de dams design was the having the factor of safety quite high than 1, more than 1 factor of safety and they has been designed using pseudo static approach. The limitation is saying that even those dams have designed using pseudo static approach, but they get failed during some of the earthquakes. Like for example, Sheffield dam in US have complete failure even the factor of safety was more than 1.2 and the KH value was considered 0.1 which is quite reasonable. For lower San Fernando Dam or upper San Fernando Dam, the value of KH is taken 0.15 that means higher than what has been considered for Sheffield Dam and still the factor of safety for the lower San Fernando Dam was 1.3 but for upper San Fernando Dam it is 2 to 2.5. So that means this is like uh, quite high compared to what you have for other two cases. Then tailings dam in Japan have a factor of 1.3. So downstream shell including crushed slip 6 feet downstream, failure of dam with release of tailings. So this, this data you have the factor of safety more than 2 or uh, that is between 2 to 2.5 that is uh, for this case is quite uh, like a heavy, quite heavy value for this factor of safety. But still even you have this, this much factor of safety, but still your dam get failed and the reason being is here because you have downstream shale including crushed slip. So, this was about. Now, coming to the advantage of the pseudo aesthetic approach, the analysis is relatively simple and straightforward. Indeed, it is significantly to the static limit equilibrium analysis routinely conducted by geotechnical engineers make compulsory uh, easy to understand, uh, computation easy to understand and perform. So, here it is easy like you know the pseudo static analysis is easy to grasp, easy to implement and easy to understand. It produces a scalar index of stability that is a factor of safety, how the accuracy of the pseudo static approach is governed by the accuracy with which the simple pseudo static inertial forces represent the complete dynamic inertial forces that actually exist during an earthquake. So, with this I conclude this session uh, that is the lecture number 42 and we already covered in the seismic slope stability analysis one part which is pseudo static analysis. We now in the next lecture we will discuss other approaches including Newmark's method. Thank you very much for your kind attention.